We're delighted to welcome New Jersey Senator Cory Booker to engage in our conversation about criminal justice reform as part of the broader discussion about American cities rebuilding. So Senator Booker, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. It's really great to be here for this conversation. Thanks for having me. Let me start off with a bigger picture question, if I can, to kind of frame our conversation as we move forward. History has shown us that oftentimes crisis can be the catalyst for change. But history has also shown us that, that oftentimes the public's appetite for change can diminish with the passage of time. We are now slightly more than four months since the death of George Floyd in police custody in Minneapolis. And my question to you is this, do you get the sense that the, the movement towards criminal judgment, justice and police reform that has sprung sadly and tragically from the death of George Floyd is, is perhaps more enduring than some other similar movements we've seen? I think the, the, the best answer for me to give you is I don't know yet. Um, we are four months out. I have seen things happen that I've never seen before. All 50 states, even uh, four nations, uh, uh, came, people came out to the streets in the millions uh, to protest. And, you know, that was a moment where George Floyd's death was after a series of high profile, uh, really wretched treatment of African Americans from Breonna Taylor to Ahmaud Arbery. And it led to some change on state legislatures from Iowa to Colorado. Uh, really banning certain practices, creating higher levels of accountability, but much more needs to be done. And so I'm very hopeful that this will be more of a movement than a moment, but none of us can rest on that. We all have to be involved in continuing uh, a larger effort. In order to find a pathway to, to change to solutions, we need to identify the specific problems. And I think part of the problem we're seeing in terms of criminal justice reform is just how are we going to couch it and what types of terms here? My question to you is this. We have seen sort of competing characterizations of the problem. We've seen some folks and good and, and well-intentioned folks saying, look, this is the, the, the bad apple scenario. The vast majority of police officers and, and the justice system people are, are good people, but they're bad apples that are going to taint everything they do. We've others have said, yes, maybe indeed the vast majority of police and law enforcement personnel are indeed good people, but there is a form of systemic racism that has infected our justice system. How do you view it? I view it as we, we should be careful about getting caught into false dichotomies. We need to seize the common ground that Americans agree on. And so let me be very, uh, very specific. Um, first, policing. Uh, Americans in general widely agree that there are certain things that we as Americans should not do. Carotid holds, majority of Republicans think we should stop that practice. No knock warrants for nonviolent crimes like the kill Breonna Taylor. We, the majority of Americans believe that we should uh, uh, ban such practices. Another thing that we all agree on is greater transparency. Our police departments shouldn't be shrouded where we cannot get data on the use of force or misconduct claims. And then finally, widely Amer Americans agree that, that we should not have officers that are fielded, uh, shielded from criminal or civil penalties um, when they do things that are egregiously wrong. But I want to pull back wider than that. The reality is, is something else that most Americans agree on. In fact, I remember sitting down when I was mayor of the city of Newark in my first months with the head of the FBI from this region and I said to him, after going through a lot of gang intelligence, how do we solve this problem? And he looks at me almost just perplexed that I would ask him such a question. He's like, we don't solve this problem. In other words, he knew that law enforcement was just treating the symptoms of the deeper problems that we as a society have failed to address. So if you ask your average American, do we want to do more on mental health care? Do we want to do more on addiction so that these things don't end up having police have to deal with them? Most Americans say, wait a minute, it'd be cheaper to do interventions on, on these issues when people are struggling or at risk or in crisis than to wait for them to become a compounding problem that ends up in our prisons, jails, and courts. And so there's a lot of area. All of us shouldn't be seeking to double down on the kind of rank partisanship we're seeing in America. 
but calling people to where we agree, let's make progress on that common ground. And the great, great thing about this time since George Floyd is I have seen the circles of empathy in this country growing. I was stunned that the number one bestsellers uh, were, were all about uh, uh, racism, uh, the legacy and the history. I saw Americans discovering things about their own country they didn't even know that the first bombing, aerial bombing in this country wasn't Pearl Harbor. It was actually in Greenwood and the Black Wall Street massacre. Most Americans didn't know about the Colfax massacres and histories of violence. So we are discovering a lot of ourselves and hopefully through that, willing to stand up more and more for what is sound, good policy that frankly is widely agreed to. You talk about the notion of, of what we should have our law enforcement people doing and perhaps what they should not be doing as, as a pathway to one of these solutions. And, and as you know, given what you do in your professional life, how you characterize things is important. The words you use can be extraordinarily important. We've seen a, a debate that seems to be focusing on the term defunding the police. And, and I think as a preface to this question, just about everybody said, no, we're not talking about doing away with police. But it sounds, when you use that term, it sounds like that's what you're talking about. So in order to get people into the conversation productively, what should we be saying? about how we deal with our police departments and the funding and the purposes of that funding? Well, I think that the first thing we should be saying, uh, to put it really bluntly, is words of kindness. And what do I mean by that? I mean, if we are gonna recognize we're in the same country, have the same destiny, we need to have more of a revival of civic grace in this country. And if we end up just listening to the other side's slogans, and trying to weaponize them for short-term political gain, it's a race to the bottom. Most of us, whether you're out in the streets saying defund the police, or whether you are the family of a police officer, most of us want to see our society lowering rates of violence. And so I, I don't want to tell anybody what their slogan should be, but I do know that we are at our best when we extend grace to each other and try to understand where each of us are coming from. I've worked with police officers. I've seen them do things. I still remember a hostage situation here in Newark where guns started going off inside of the building and my police officers ran into that building, no situational awareness, uh, a bullet's just been shot. The courage of that is extraordinary. But I also know how many black Americans, including myself, when I was younger have awful stories of being disproportionately stopped, accused of stealing things, guns drawn on me and the more. We all want to have a society that is better than we are right now. And instead of starting to declare things battleground, again, we need to find our common ground. And I know this may sound to some people earnest and naive, but it's not. We, unless we can enter into a conversation. Now, let me give you an example of that. Barack Obama very functionally pulled together a task force on 21st century policing. He was able to get at the same table in a working group, Black Lives Matter leaders and big city police chiefs. And here's the thing, they agreed to dozens, they agreed to dozens of recommendations that they put into a report. Well, that report's now collecting dust. We implemented that where all that common ground they found, it would make our society safer, it would lower crime, and it would empower human flourishing. That's the kind of grace and constructive work we need right now in our country. Why does that sit there then? Just, just the fact, as you said, the fact of getting all of those disparate individuals and perspectives at the same table, and the fact that they could walk away with a, an array of recommendations. Mm -hmm. Obviously, nobody got everything they were looking for. That's not going to happen. But the fact that there was a, a, a report with an array of recommendations that everybody could agree to, why has no one essentially ever heard of that and why has nothing happened? Well, it's because, I, and I don't mean, this is not, a, I don't mean this in a partisan way because I, I, if anything, I've developed in New Jersey's reputation of working on both sides of the aisle. But that was one of the final things of the Barack Obama administration. And we then had a president who wanted to do everything they could to tear down things that that administration did. And and so I, I just want to be candid. We have a president right now that refuses to even admit what his own FBI director has spoken to, which is the implicit racial bias exists in policing. 
that is, in fact has gone after, called it un-American, racial sensitivity training or gender sensitivity training, and literally turned, up, turned agencies upside down because they're not confronting these issues. So uh, I, I, just, I, just, I just know that this is not partisan. Uh, I can tell you my colleagues on the other side of that work on it, but we have a president that has been uniquely uh, uh, unsuited for the healing we need, bringing people together, finding that common ground, and forging a path forward, and instead has decided that they would throw Molotov cocktails on all the dry leaves of the, uh, of the, of the animus uh, of our country as opposed to trying to address it. Let me ask about some specific issues here when we're talking about the notion of criminal justice reform. And I want to talk about sentencing and sentencing structures. Now, I was I was a prosecutor in New Jersey in, in the 70s, a defense attorney into the 80s and the early 90s before I transitioned into journalism. And I saw a, a, a process, um, an inexorable process, that was sentences need to be longer, more harsh, that's the way we deal with crime. Uh, we saw first within the federal system, mandatory sentencing guidelines um, that were indeed harsh. Even judges said, why are we doing this? I I'm a judge, give let me exercise my own wisdom here. Don't give me a grid and tell me that this is what the sentence has to be. Many states also adopted the notion of mandatory sentencing guidelines. Now we've gotten away from them to some extent, but there's still recommended guidelines there. And you still see, at, at, when you look at our sentencing structure, there have been a lot of studies that have said, we are far too harsh in many instances in how we sentence individuals. What can we be doing to, to get the attention of legislators, both, both federally and locally and statewide, to get people to look at this idea of how do we re how do we reform sentencing so that it can be a, a, a much more realistic approach to what we would like our justice system to be. Well, I, I'm so happy you bring this up because one of my the largest bills I was able to help write and pass was a massive sentencing reform in the First Step Act. Uh, that was able to lower a lot of these mandatory minimums, get rid of uh, the three strikes you're out, and return uh, more authority back to judges to ignore uh, um, some of those sentencing guidelines if the, if the case uh, uh, mandated. So we made some progress, but the name of the bill is the First Step Act, which is really an indication of that we have a lot longer of a journey to go on. And, and most Americans don't realize that. During that historical period you talked about, our criminal justice system shifted dramatically to now at the point between 98 and 99% of criminal convictions in America uh, are not trials and juries. Uh, they're plea bargains because prosecutors now have enormous power to stack these different uh, crimes and, and go to a, a young defendant, first time in trouble with the law, who's afraid and scared and has a public defender that has dozens, if not hundreds of cases that they're trying to deal with. And they just simply say, look, I, I'm threatening you. You're going to face 40 years in prison or you can plead guilty and we'll let you out time served. And what that person doesn't realize is because there's a great book written called Why Innocent People Plead Guilty. And this is one of the reasons is that they, they think they're free, but they're not. Now they have a felony conviction. And unfortunately, the, as the American Bar Association points out, they have 40,000 collateral consequences of things they can't do. Can't get a loan, can't get many jobs, can't get many business licenses. And so the system in a very short period of time is tilted dramatically towards prosecutorial power, discretion, and that's when you get things that are even more complicated. When you control for race now in America, same crime, same issues, you see that Blacks and Latinos will get a much higher uh, uh, a sentence and much more likely to get the full mandatory minimum, uh, as opposed to finding ways to reduce uh, implicit racial bias, to balance the system, to create more equality. And, I, and I'm sorry, we now have weird realities from this drug war where in, in 2017, the last year I have data for, we had more marijuana possession arrests uh, in this country than all violent crime arrests combined. We now have people with felony convictions uh, for doing things that two of the last three presidents admitted to doing. And, and this really is 
created a reality that this criminal justice is perverse, unjust, or as Brian Stevenson uh, uh, points out, we have a criminal justice system now treats you much better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. During that period of time that I mentioned, if you were running for public office, chances are you ran on a platform that says, I am tough on crime and I'm going to, I'm going to move to jack up sentences. And when people go in, they're not getting out. We're going to do away with parole, which many places have, or at least limited parole. And we're going to have bigger numbers attached to sentences. Right. Do you get any sense now, certainly where you are, um, Congress, the House and the Senate, uh, and even within, let's say, New Jersey, that, that the political figures are, are stepping back from that and not using that as their springboard to office? I, I'm definitely seeing that change. I was a law student when the 94 crime bill came out, and a lot of us were up in arms about what we knew would happen. In fact, we were building a new prison or jail in America every 10 days from around the time I was in law school to the time I was mayor of the city of Newark. I am so happy to say that, that that energy has shifted from us putting billions of dollars to building out that infrastructure to now people realizing through evidence-based models that there is far lower cost ways uh, uh, to treat people who are in trouble. And again, access to treatment. We in New Newark, New Jersey, we started our first ever veterans courts. Here you have a person that fought, and veterans are more likely to be arrested for drug crimes than your average American. But now you have a, a judge that sits there, has specialties with veterans, can see people that might have mental health challenges or other points of crisis. And we know that actually it's not only that, it's not only a better way to, and fairer way to treat individuals, but it actually lowers recidivism rates. It actually lowers costs to taxpayers. And again, it elevates human well-being. So there's a lot of wisdom that's been gained but from a system that's gone horribly wrong, but we still have to take a lot more corrective action. And you know this, we call ourselves the land of the free, but there's no nation on the God's planet or earth that incarcerates more of its people than the United States of America. Just four to five percent of the planet's population and about a quarter of the prison population. And for women, one out of every three imprisoned women on the planet is right here in the United States because we love to incarcerate women, especially about 80 to 90 percent of women we incarcerate are survivors of sexual trauma, sexual violence. Uh, we love to incarcerate the, the broken people who are, are drug addicted or mentally ill. Overwhelmingly, our, 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 our system is full of, of people who are poor, mentally ill, or addicted, and disproportionately people who are black and brown. It's just a broken system we, we have to tear it down. When you talk about the cost of incarceration, it, it brings me to the next topic I want to talk to you about, and that is the notion of bail and bail reform. Now, state of New Jersey has been in the forefront of bail reform. Um, New York City, state of New York, has, has engaged in acts of bail reform also. But you talk about the, the cost, the, the sheer human cost, and even the dollars and cents cost. Uh, this is a, a statistic that shocked me, and I think it's illustrative. The, the notorious Rikers Island yes. survey, a study came out and said that the, it was a majority, I believe, of people who were incarcerated at Rikers Island had never even been convicted yet. Their cases had never even got into court. And a significant majority of them were charged with nonviolent crimes, many of whom, once their case got reached, were probably going to be sentenced to probation or, or a time served or something like that. So yeah. you're talking about extraordinary costs for people, dollars and cents, extraordinary human costs, people who lose their jobs, who lose their families, and, and I think the problem is, you know this, you're a lawyer. I don't think most people do. The purpose of bail is to guarantee that somebody will show up for their hearing. Right? Most people think the purpose of bail is to get a head start on punishment. How do we then engage the, yeah. the, the general populace to get them to understand that and to get them not to be fearful of letting somebody out who's been charged with something? I, I, first of all, I, I've been to Rikers Island. My first time there, I was mayor of the city of Newark, a whole bunch of kids around me, uh, um, talked with them for a while until I asked them how long they've been there, six months, eight months, a year, 15 months. And then I asked them, well, what have you been convicted of? And they're like, no, no, we're all awaiting trial. It was so stunning to me. And as you said, for most people who, who might have the resources, their children would not be in these horrific environments. And, and, and there for things 
that were, were relative to that punishment so minor. It is, it is such an injustice. And by the way, while they're there, things that we do to them while they're in prison, like putting them in solitary confinement for days on end, psychological professionals call that torture because of the traumatization it does to children. And so I, I, I cannot tell you, before, before I use the metaphor, tear the system down, what I really mean is healing the system, fixing the system. And the bail system, as you're, you're indicating, is one of these things that has become so twisted that we've created, in a sense, debtors' prisons here in the United States of America. And until we can address this, uh, we are falling so far short of who we say we are. Now, there's been incredible evidence-based models of reforms that have, have actually yielded people coming back for their trials uh, um, and helping us to keep the same levels uh, of adherence to our system. It is not necessary. And this is why I'm just really grateful that more and more people are stepping up and stepping forward to end this uh, effectively a, a debtor's prison in America. I, I, I'm gonna come back in a moment to a, a, a sort of a summation question for you, if, if I might, amongst two lawyers here. Uh, but I, I do wanna ask you about something that I, I, I'm struck by and I, I think it's, it's, it's fascinating and so compelling. Um, you very recently introduced legislation co-sponsored by uh, Senator Richard Burr, a Republican from North Carolina. And the purpose of that was to posthumously award the Congressional Gold Medal. That's the highest civilian medal that this nation recognizes, the highest civilian honor this nation recognizes, to Emmett Till and to his mother, Mamie Till Mobley. I think most people nowadays, it's interesting, Emmett Till often referred to as the sacrificial lamb of the civil rights movement as a consequence of his death in 1955 and, and the trial that was so shocking afterwards. Um, why do you feel that th that's an important thing for us to do today, to recognize him and his mother? Well, you indicated this when we were talking earlier about how there, in, in our history, many people have used the most horrific of, 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 of traumatic trial and turned it into something more powerful a movement and hope. And so here's a very young man that was murdered so viciously and savagely that the trial was so unjust of the people that were accused of it. Here was a courageous mother leaving his coffin open, making the world stare at the horrors of racial violence and white supremacy. And, and it ignited the conscience of our country. And it tragically died, but he did not die in vain. He became a rallying cry of activism and engagement. Uh, his mother and him made sure that America saw the horrors it confronted itself, it looked in the mirror and made more people want to try to drive change into our system. And so I'm, I'm honored to be one of the drivers of that legislation. And I, uh, I just, I hope we, we do indeed pass it. I, I think for people, if nothing else, for as a, a, a helpful tool for people to remember that case, the horror of the case, as you said, uh, you know, two men tried more evidence than I've ever seen, and I've tried a lot of murder cases, but it was in Mississippi in 1955, and ultimately, as you know, they confessed openly to yeah. having murdered him afterwards and with no consequences whatsoever. So I, I think just the, the reminder of the episode I think would have great value for us in this time. Let me, you, you and I could talk forever, but you have things to do um, about all these issues. But let me ask you one last question that we've talked about the notion of, is this the time and the place? It, is the momentum that has been generated by the, the tragic death of George Floyd something that may well be now more than fleeting and may well be enduring? Are you, you talked about what we're looking for here. Are you optimistic as you sit here today that if we talk again five years from now, we might be able to point to significant and substantial reform to our justice system? Well, you know, hope is earned, is earned. And the way you be hopeful is be uh, determined, uh, take action, to step up, to stand up. And what I worry about, King said it so eloquently, he said the problem today, what we have to repent for is not the vitriolic words and violent actions of the bad people, but the appalling silence and inaction of the good people. 
And so if more good people who are willing to admit and recognize that we are falling short of our ideals of justice, if more good people get involved and get engaged, uh, we will earn the right to be hopeful and we will see hopeful things happening at a greater pace. I worry that our biggest crisis right now is our poverty, our poverty of empathy, where we don't see the struggles of people who may live close to us or but, but in a different town, a different neighborhood, or uh, get a very different experience with this criminal justice system, and we're just unaware of it or don't have the empathy to know and to learn. So I hope this is a great awakening for our country and that we realize that uh, the, the American dream uh, is not real for anyone unless it's in the reach un, under the reach of everyone. So I, 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 I'm going to do everything I can to earn the right to be hopeful. Senator Booker, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. We certainly appreciate your sharing your thoughts and perspectives on all of this. Uh, I'm you'll be well. Having this, uh, this focus, it means, it means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. You take care. Be well. We'll look forward to talking with you again. I do as well. Thank you.